Hello, everyone. Welcome Hi. to. Hi, Molly. Lovely to see you. You too. I'd like to welcome not Molly Newman to Measure of Music. Molly, thank you for joining us. I'm so happy to be here. I think my cats want to join too. They're <laughs> swimming around, so you know we'll keep it light. I'm sure everyone would love it. Um, <laughs> they made it appear. <laughs> um, also, one of your your daughter's birthday today, if I recall correctly. It's a it's a wild day in Los Angeles. I know we have people from all over uh, the world, but you know we have a blizzard happening. Oh it's there's literal snow on the hills right here where I live. Um, it's constant rain, and yeah, we have a birthday party this afternoon um, that originally we had planned to do outside because that's why you live in LA. I live in LA. But, um, <laughs> we are we're able to move it inside, but it is a, it's a little bit of an unusual. Uh, reality right now, but I'm so excited to be here, and I loved actually both of the you know the BMAT and the feed um, you know mentioned topics that they were discussing because it, it there everything's connected in what we do you know and um, I would I would say that the metadata problem is um, part of some of our mental health problems at the end of the day. <laughs> I'm not joking about mental health, don't get me wrong, but I mean, you know, it is, it, this is, we are not, we are not where, you know, this is a, a constant issue that we have not yet solved, so. Absolutely. Um, and I love Molly because we just dive right into the conversation. You haven't even had a chance to introduce yourself yet. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's a little presumptuous of me. Sorry. <laughs> oh, that's great. I love it. I also burst in the conversations like midstream. So I completely get it. Um, Molly, please tell everyone a bit about yourself. Sure. So uh, my name is Molly Newman. I'm the CMO, the Chief Marketing Officer of Downtown Music um, Holdings, our parent company at Downtown. Uh, Downtown has sort of two divisions, um, one that's very B2B focused and that has um, Fuga, a distribution company. It has um, Downtown Music, which is, uh, does artists and label services and publishing services and song trust. And um, we have a creator focused um, side of the business that's really, you know, led by CD Baby, who's having their 25th anniversary this year, which is incredible in our universe to have something that's super focused on empowering individual artists and songwriters and, and musicians um, to own their, you know, their work. And, and um, it's, you know, ideally very empowering, but it's also really challenging because, you know, some of the, the things that we were just talking about, um, I have been in the music business in some fashion for about 30 years. I started as a musician, as a drummer, um, and uh, uh, got into working for a record company and doing artist management. And then in the sort of early 2000s, mid 2000s, I guess the early aughts or mid aughts, what you would say. Um, yeah, <laughs> sort of pivoted into digital music. Um, and which was fortunate was that I worked for a, a, a service that sold downloads, but um, you know, this pre Spotify pre streaming ubiquity. Um, and so that was a, an interesting time because everything was so volatile and so much uh, you know, money was being redistributed. I, I would say, you know, now when we look at, you know, how much revenue there is in the music industry, it's about where it was in the nineties. That's sort right. of like the, apex but it's not going in the same places in the same way which is you know for some people is good and some people it isn't so you know that's a it's a very interesting time and that's been going on for basically 15 years right like we've been transitioning how how things are working um and it's i so and now i work at downtown music i i did various things in between um worked at a company called rhapsody now known as napster the the you know, uh, paid service and um, HOIM, the uh, American Association for Independent Record Labels, um, independent music, but the, it's a trade association for labels. And um, I had a, a, a dip out of traditional-ish music companies and worked at Kickstarter for two years, leading their music category. Um, and that was a, a pretty interesting opportunity that when I came to downtown to, to work at SongTrust and then um, eventually became president of SongTrust before my current role, um, was really relevant in lots of different ways. P 
partially because of a different way, you know, sort of tech focused, even though it's, a, it's an unusual tech company um, or can be organized and, you know, different, like, you know, just product teams and engineering teams and different, you know, sort of like that. Uh, yeah, it really was an organizational visibility that I hadn't quite had um, before at that level. Um, and so that's, it gets all kind of threads into where I am now. And, and I find every single high and low that I've been, you know, able to have for better or worse over my career has been useful and, um, you know, to where, to the things that I do now. Yeah, you've had quite the journey. Also, um, I saw your recent post that you are going to be picking the drums back up again. That's very exciting. Yeah, yeah. So that's, <laughs> it, it, it is interesting. Like, so yeah, my band, Bratmobile, um, who was very active at sort of different, we had a, a four year um, when we were just out of, in and out of college, like, you know, that was our first era. And then we took a break for a few years. And then we started again at the end of the 90s for about four more years. Um and we got an inquiry at the end of, of 22, you know, would you be able to play again? And we had things come up before, but it really didn't seem, um, it wasn't the right time for me, whether my kid was too young or, um, you know, my, the singer and I didn't live in the same place, but now we both live here. And um, so it just, they're like, oh, well, maybe now is the time. And it's interesting thinking about, you know, what we were talking about with mental health and music. And I actually caught on the radio this morning, um, Andy Taylor from Duran Duran, some of you probably know, like he's in late stage cancer and it's yeah. horrible, but, you know, talking about sort of the, the healing elements of whether it's listening or playing or the, any creativity. Uh, I think there's something of that for me too. You know, I do, I work in music in such a all encompassing way to have the chance to actually literally play um, is, you know, has a, a dimension to it. That's really rewarding. Um, and also trying to do all the mechanical things that I, you know, try to direct a lot, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of <laughs> individuals to do, to try to do some of them myself. Like, not such a bad idea to actually know what you're talking about sometimes. Um, so it's not easy. Yeah. I'll just put it that way. I believe that. No, I love that. Um, I think there's so many, it's so interesting because there's so many executives that you still, still do kind of do play music. Um, and I think yeah. like, it's possible, right? Like I'm, I said your questions, we're going to bounce around these questions a bit. Thinking about this and just thinking about what you're talking about there, um, let's talk a bit about just like how this is possible, right? Like the idea of being a musician that's not a full-time musician, but able to kind of do their thing, be it a songwriter, a producer, an engineer, but being able to potentially do it on the side, turn it into a full-time or not. Like, how is that possible now? I feel like downtown music voting is really actually helping get people to that point. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, you know, from a a marketer kind of perspective, like thinking about your customer types or, or whatever it is, you know, certainly you have to think about the, the stages of a, a musician's career. If, you know, there's probably like a very aspirational, I just love it. I just want to do it. I don't actually care who hears it um, to the, to that sort of what, what then sparks recognition or an audience, or, you know, maybe there's, there's a possibility of some, you know, actual money being earned that would give you the ability to do more or, um, you know, the encouragement to do more. Um, and then there's a sort of like high velocity things that just take off. Right. And then uh, establish. So you think about there, there, there are all these different sort of possibilities and, and certainly within our company, we have, yeah, that sort of like, you want to just, you, you're aspiring and you want it handled and you want things to be on platforms and so people can listen to it. And then you have, you know, actual momentum and you want to make sure that you're getting everything that you're owed because you know that there is all this activity in lots of different places around the world. Um, and then you have that sort of like, how do you actually get it I, don't know, I, I hate like, some of these words that we all use so much, like optimized, but the one yeah. that came to my head, it's like, Ugh, mm -hmm. I don't love it, but it's the <laughs> truth, right? Like, you know, how do you get it? How do you, how do you really 
get it into a place where it's, it's, you know, you're taking advantage of all of the opportunities and you know what to do. And you, and in those cases, you probably have a team or you have um, some sort of infrastructure that will give you, you know, that stability. Um, so those are the things that I think the, the, current climate in the in the industry it's so interesting to think about and I do have that perspective of these 30 years because when we started our band there was nothing you know what I mean like we it, literally I mean lit, lit, I know every time I do a, a talk like this I'm sort of like it's I know guys like literally the internet was for the defense yeah. I mean, there's some like it wasn't, it master. wasn't something that we, had, you know, we didn't have mobile phones. Um, we had letters and, you know, like we booked things on the phone and with fax machines and all of those things. That was a modern te technology. So, you know, everything was just a little bit, you, you really did have to rely on either, you know, there's, I think there's some stories about, you know, a lot of like hip hop artists, obviously, and, in, in, you know, major cities who would, press up records and sell them out of their trunks and get, you know, like that was a real thing. You'd probably sell 10,000 copies in that way in a small market or, you know, even smaller medium market. And that's a real, you know, that's real revenue um, to do it as a underground or punk or whatever it is kind of artists on your own really did kind of need gatekeepers or, you know, access paths. Right. So we had to have distribution. We had to, in our case, we worked with friends who had record companies. Um, and we, you know, there, there was a, a pretty consistent sort of deal structure for those kinds of companies. They were 50, 50, right? Yeah, so yeah. you would like, maybe they would front the money to, for the recording, but once expenses were covered, you just split everything 50, 50. Um, and that was, I think a lot of independent labels that had some kind of artistic core either the artist started the label, you know, or it was a friend and something along those lines, um, which is a, a pretty fair deal. You know, I mean, I think what, what's now kind of interesting is that you go to a company like CD Baby, and in our case with that, with our deal, you know, there's a minimal setup cost, but it's 9%. And if you look at the numbers and you are willing to do the work, and that's a kind of what I was talking about earlier, like, there's a lot of work to do, especially with communicating directly with your audience and your fans and making the best of all of these, these opportunities. It, it really, you know, it's not, that's not creative. And a lot of artists I know don't want to bother with that. So there's, you know, I think this is just a, a really interesting time of opportunity and a lot of the things that I sort of come back to, which you know, or it's not the, the most exciting thing to talk about. It's like, you know, you are inherently a business person as a creative, you know, you know, with your creative pursuits, if you think that you are going to spend money or get any money, sorry, you know, and those, those things are like, it's not very fun to talk like that. But I think that there are a lot of people who are doing it very well. Um, I, I love Mickey Shiloh. I don't know if you all know her. She's a she has her own sort of artist platform for distribution, pub admin and and sync. Um she she's incredible. And she's like she's so she's so uh also incredible and credible. She is an artist and a songwriter and a producer herself, and she's trying to make this network of, you know, possibility for people with the same values. And it's never not reminded that there's a ton of actual, you know, roll up your sleeves work, work. to do. Yeah, definitely. Work to be done, definitely. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so one of the words you said, the optimization. Yeah, I agree. Don't love that word. The word that I don't like is consumption. It feels like drugs. <laughs> like, everybody here always feels like I'm like trying to push drugs with someone. So like I get you and like the words we use, you know? <laughs> we, and we struggle, we struggle with language in every direction, unfortunately. Yeah. But yeah, it's... <laughs> Some of the things that all of a sudden I'm like, why is everybody using this phrase? Like, what happened? Yeah. <laughs> Where did they come from? <laughs> <laughs> um, so what you're talking through there, one of the things that came that like my attention was you're talking about getting all this, getting all this money, getting all this information from all over the world. Um, I think that's really interesting um, because I think 
hopefully the world's starting to realize a bit that the entire music industry is not just America. Um, right. There are 90 countries present here for Measure of Music, which is really exciting. Um, Amazing. And, like, we love them. Um, so, like, I want you to talk a bit about that, right? What does that space look like? What about Latin America, Asia, Africa? Like, Stephanie was the biggest artist in the world last year. Like, what is this happening? Yeah. Like, what's going you on? You know, here? I was, I was um, really... I mean, I think this is public information, but, you know, like the, the top genres in, at most of the streaming platforms now are non-Anglo pop and non-Anglo mm-hmm. hip hop. Mm-hmm. Um, so obviously non-Anglo means anything outside of the U.S. and the U.K. or, you know, non-English um, yeah. uh, language. So that in aggregate from all of these different global markets, that's pretty significant. But I think what it is what's so exciting about it. i mean obviously the uh, you know the music that's coming out of these places is compelling and relevant globally outside of local markets you also know that there are these you know these specifically and i remember when i first joined song trust one of the things that i was lucky enough to do was go to um uh estonia and the the conference that they have every year there and that was 2018 so i think they had it in 19 but maybe they obviously haven't since then in the same way but um if anyone knows in the chat let us know but um you know estonian hip-hop was the number one genre there right and that doesn't probably translate too much or transfer too much to other genres but so you see this like incredible um activity in local markets with local audiences, which is awesome. You see that translating into other markets like clearly Spanish language and like, you know, Bad Buddy, obviously the, one of the best examples of Rosalia, you know, like singing a hundred percent in Spanish, but having being such an impactful global artist. Um, you know, I mean, I think it's, it's really, it's for me personally, who loves shifting power structures, and, you know, centralized to power control, right? We'd love to see it. So, you know, what does that mean? And also, what does that mean for those kinds of artists? Because you have these, you know, very, very powerful examples of, you know, that are supported by major record companies or major infrastructure, whatever it is. But then you see a lot of that going into, you know, different, um, you know, with a, a an offer like, a CD baby or a core or just your kid, you know, the, the, the path to these, um, to the distribution having been um, opened up is, is truly incredible. So that I think is, is really interesting. And then, you know, because I have had so much specific experience over the last five years in music publishing for this kind of um, profile of songwriter or rights holder, then you've had a whole new can of worms, right? Like you could, because every local jurisdiction has local regulations. Some of them are, are technically law. Some of them are, you know, just policies. Um, they're not great talking to each other. Yes. You know, <laughs> and let's just gently put it that way. Um, and so you've got this increase in volume. You've got this increase in you know, micro royalties, if you want to call it that, right? $250 and less is a hard, it's hard. $250 and more is really hard to get for some, for a lot of this category of creator. And that's a burden to, to, to administer for like a company like ours. And I'm not saying that that's a burden we don't want. I'm just saying it's like, it's a lot of work. And certainly for every individual society who, you know, I mean, SASM, with 170 years old, they're a very forward thinking society. They're very, they're investing in technology and infrastructure. But even in that case, it's, you know, it's quite difficult. So, you know, I think that's where, you know, what BMAT and other companies are, are endeavoring to do and ours, you know, trying to find solutions for accuracy and, you know, some kind of truth <laughs> of rights. Um, and you know, like how, how do you make sure that these, because when the mistakes are made and if they're made from the beginning, um, it is a cascading effect of pain. And, um, you know, I think that's a, it's, I, I hope that 
in the coming years with all of these dynamics at play that there might actually be a way to solve these problems together yeah. um, instead of, you know, but, but we're in a, in, this is a capitalist world that we're living in from in the music business. So, yeah. you know, <laughs> that's, it's, it's not easy. Absolutely. Um, and I will say we have an international music panel tomorrow that I'm really excited about. Uh, Farrell from uh, TuneCore is on it. And she says, hi, Molly. Oh, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> awesome. Yes, of course. Hi. <laughs> so, so speaking of that, so I think one of the things that's kind of like the kind of the obvious next step, given what we we're just talking about is, you know, with the rise of Infrabeats, with the rise of Latin music and things like that, Basically, people are starting to pay attention. Um, and like you mentioned, we live in a capitalist society. So with people starting to pay attention, it means you know more resources, more attention. Um, what does that look like? How does how do we take what's happening with our musicians? You know, we're seeing a much more diverse um, you know, musicians, songwriters, things like that. How do we take that and translate that to the actual boardrooms, to the actual executives? How do we make everything reflect what people are actually listening to? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you, you, these things, we get a lot of reminders of, of the, the painful truths, right? I mean, and I'm not, I, I am so grateful when I get some acknowledgement or recognition for my career or my work, or, you know, I think the, the work of our teams, but I have a, a, a slightly dubious relationship with, you know, these lists that kind of, you know, <laughs> get put out, but you have one, you know, very clear one is this, the Billboard magazine does a top power 100 every year. And I think someone does the work quickly because when you have 100, it's actually not that difficult to do the math and to see what the, you know, diversity statistics are, right? So, you know, the top of mind one that, uh, you know, is that we're at 28% women. I think that was 29 last year. Right. So, um, and I think maybe it went up to 32 one year or something like that. I I can't remember what the the number was, but, but it's still not good enough. And I think, you know, I saw there's some people voting for the rock hall of fame, um, that are in my network and I, they're posting their ballots. They don't post who they vote for, but they post like, these are my options. Oh my God, my options. Like, what do I do? And I'm like, well, I've seen one woman who's a voter right now. So I'm hoping that at least she has a commitment perhaps to 50-50. But I don't know if that's like, I would say that that's sort of like, you know, the current power structure needs to have hopefully some commitment towards that balance. And, you know, yeah, they're all great, great artists there, but we really have to, you know, I think have that motivation of of a, a result that is, you know, much improved. Um, and there's, you know, a lot of work in various corners, I guess, around um, where does that work start, right? So we have She is the Music in the US, we have Moving the Needle, which is very focused on the production and technical roles of music. The one that that our company and our founder, um, Justin Clifford's has been very supportive of and actually how I got to know him is something called sound thinking, which is around bringing um, music production and and music industry roles and that path um, of availability to New York City public school, high school students. So it's like a very tactical kind of, you know, way to execute um, getting more opportunity because it is, I I think, you know, and then you see, the and and moving the needle is great. I I think they have some reports coming out pretty soon about some data around this. But if I'm not mistaken, I think the you know the number of women producers in the top 100, for example, is like two. You know, and it's it's really just really painful. And um, you know, so how do you? there's a it's like an all hands on deck kind of effort theoretically to to make that that level of change um when i think it's reasonable to to try to approach it that way um but you know that's me yeah yes definitely and (laughs) and i think you know a lot of these issues just get exacerbated when you talk about intersectionality um when you talk about you know 100 percent when you talk about different races ethnicities backgrounds 
or even areas that people don't talk about enough, like geography. Um, geography, you know, being place. from a, a rural environment, exactly. you know, um, being from, you know, and certainly like economic, you know, class environment. Um, all of these things absolutely are co connected. And so, you know, I think it's important that we have obviously um, opportunities like the one that you're um, generating to have meaningful discussion. Um, and I, I'm, you know, I have to say, this was not the center of discussion in music conferences three years ago. So like, let's talk pre-pandemic, okay? And, you know, one of the things that I've been really proud of over the past few years, um, I think, you know, so hopefully some of you all know Portia Saban, who's the president of the Music Biz Association. She started her role, I think, about the fall of 19. So, you know, very focused on, um, you know, sort of they, they their their main thing is an annual conference and, you know, in person. Um, and I was on the advisory board at the time when she when she she invited me to the advisory board. And so one of the first things that we did was we had a DEI uh, um, committee that we started. So that was sort of in place when things started to have to pivot to virtual and they did an incredible job. And I think JJ and Nick, who are part of your family here, are um, were instrumental in executing, obviously, all of the virtual work that they did um, that first year of the pandemic. But, you know, starting starting from then, like there was... I think, and obviously all of the events of, um, you know, the summer of 2020 with Joy Floyd's murder and, and Blackout Tuesday and all this sort of like accelerated consciousness in discussion around issues of, of race, but also, you know, there was fortunately some ability to connect to all of these barriers yeah. um, into conversation. And so I think it's become much, probably for some, tedious right for some is like a little <laughs> bit like not certainly uncomfortable and certainly like uh, again are we talking about this but i don't care yeah right. we are talking about this because it's still painful and it's still not acceptable and, and there's a lot of work to do um and you know when it comes down to you know the billions of dollars that our industry generates and again you know where those are broken out and what does that mean when 2% of the, the, you know, producers of the top 100 or whatever it is are women, yeah. that means 98% of the revenue generated in that area is going to not women. Right. Yeah. So let's like, that is just, we have to, I think, bring the, the economics of it into that. And what does that mean for the first, for the go forward? Um, and how are those decisions made? So I think back to what you were describing, when you have what works in these current, in the status quo, and we're a pretty risk adverse industry, yes. <laughs> uh, you know, there is little appetite for, you know, radical transformation of, of these, you know, ratios. And so whether it's like this sort of, mediocre improvements of a percent here we'll take we'll take what we can get right but we have to be committed hopefully toward uh, a much more you know balanced situation yeah, yeah absolutely yes um i always find it funny people in the industry know that the industry is not as progressive as it likes to pretend it is sometimes um so sometimes we have to pull it in kicking and screaming a bit um some people in the chat um are shouting out some other organizations to check out um key change for example that's talking yes. about you know um the representation within festivals um tomorrow ebony smith from Gem gender amplifies what our keynote for tomorrow um and she's working in the producer space to help um gender parity um and i'm also the uk director for she said so here in the uk right the yes of uh, uh women's organization and women in music um over in the us um who's also a media partner for this weekend. Oh, gosh, I could go on and on, but there's a lot of people out there that want to help. Um, so if you haven't checked out any of these organizations, please do. Um, yes. 
we only have 10 minutes left. Um, <laughs> so, um, there's some questions popping in over in a summit. There's some questions popping in here. Um, one more question I have for you, and then we'll get to someone else's questions. Um, one area that I think downtown music is really interesting is because there's so much in the portfolio, there's a lot of really important roles that kind of go, go overlooked. Um, so what I mean by that is if people come to me all the time, they're like, Christy, I want to be an A&R. I'm like, cool, that's great. But there's like a billion other jobs in the music industry as well. Huh? <laughs> Can you talk a bit just about kind of like what people yeah. are doing in downtown? What kind of roles yeah. are interesting right now? Things like that. For sure. Yeah. I mean, I think the, um, the, because I spent four and a half years um, at Song Trust and, and leading Song Trust uh, for the last two and a half. The um, you know the the work that what we call the rights management operations team you know does from you know copyright um, registration and uh, sort of even onboarding a, a catalog requires <laughs> again. It, there is a lot of automation possibilities, but there are almost inherently in publishing. And I give my band always as a, as a good example, we're a trio, you know, we, we started and in, in all of our songs, we have decided to split three ways. So that doesn't add up to 100. You know, it's 30, someone has to have 33.4%. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to, so with some, there has to be, some way so there's a decision that's required like someone has to talk who's going to get it who's you know and if someone claims it like and i this is a scenario that is real i could just as easily go oh i sort of before i don't know and it's from that error so many things can go south until you you know kind of resolve it that there's you know in in publishing and then because of the way that you know you sort of said in a company like ours we centralize the rights and then we distribute them to um all of these other you know networks um it's just a, a really cascading uh, possibility for conflict and that is where the money stops right they're not going to pay you if things are in conflict and so yeah. you have to resolve it you have to get it so there's a lot of those sort of really probably not glamorous roles um but, but they're click you know critical um and then there's you know a lot of i think most companies you know whether they consider themselves a technology company or not are using tremendous amounts of tools and and platforms and resources and i do want to acknowledge you all are very organized you know you all are really getting it done with this you know this a lot of details to to run a global you know uh conference of this level so i'm very <laughs> impressed um and, and but you can do it with a you with a small and motivated team you know and focused and you know there are a lot of decisions that you can make in advance and then you got whatever oh someone's internet goes down and that they all goes sideways um but uh so there's you know we have a lot of technology roles we have a lot of people who work you know at their on the recorded music side of the companies on um it, they they're called marketing roles but they're really kind of you know managing the repertoire and mm -hmm. the um, priorities of their clients yeah. and sort of like the network to the um services and making sure that you know those priorities are understood and and well considered and then you know lots of of things in between um you know customer service are huge you know at some of our our bigger platform companies those are you know very critical roles and so i think we're we're always balancing that um what can you automate or what can you make um scaled and then what where do you have to intervene you know with the actual human and have decisions that are applied um so that's there, there are a lot of those yeah and, and then obviously there we have a creative teams that work with um you know placing works in film tv and advertising um yeah there are a lot of different kinds of roles a and r i think is an interesting one to think about because you know the discovery of artists that used to probably be the the foundation of a lot of those roles used to be in person at a club or something you know or through a lawyer possibly in other ways um and you know those things are there's you know with all this activity that's happening on the sort of self-distributed you know universe i mean we know that there's a lot of like 
hey, what's happening here? Let me jump on that, you know, and um, using data for, you know, identifying artists in, in all of these, especially in the, the global market. It's also kind of a, a interesting way. They're all really quite connected. Yeah, definitely, definitely. It's funny because I think Downtown is a really interesting company because it like toes the line of like tech company and music company. So even mm-hmm. like certain titles might like, you might, so someone might hear, you know, marketing and think one thing, but really that's what we call accounts or commercial if you're on recorded music side and all kinds of other fun, like differences on how things go. Um, so I think- It's it's interesting. <laughs> I think we have a, a sort of existential discussion sometimes in some parts of our company are like, you know, you really want to be a music company, mm-hmm. you know, for whatever that defi- is defined by that individual. But you also, every single person, including those much more creative, they want the platform tools and um, the stability scale. of the information to scale and to like, you know, know that things are correct, right? So you, you, I've, I've tried to not be so binary about it and be <laughs> like a little bit, you know, that we are, Every company at this point, I think, say for maybe the local donut shop in my town that doesn't take, that's cash only, yes. you know, like, <laughs> they're, 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 they they might not be a tech company, right? <laughs> but like most of the ones that use Apple Pay and, you know, yeah. manage their social feeds and all of this stuff, like, they, you know, they're working both. Exactly. Exactly. I think music companies that embrace technology are the ones that get to move ahead, you know, that that yeah, get to yeah. make decisions, that get to shape culture in a lot of ways too, which is really interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay, so we have time for, I think, literally one question. So uh, um, um, <laughs> it's a really fun one to end it on though. Um, the question came from uh, Nami. They say, I wonder if Molly could speak a bit on her experience with self-publishing and touch on her zine, which I love this question. <laughs> self-publishing and what was the last bit? Oh, of my zine? zine that you have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, well, self-publishing in, you know, the early 90s was just going to the coffee shop. <laughs> and, you know, so like spending, you know, I didn't even have a computer. I had, um, you know, we ha- we used um, letter sets. So if you go to an art, art store, you'll see these like rub- rub-on letters. So a lot of our sort of like you know, masthead, which we did not call it, master, was like, uh, you know, letra set and handwriting. And we had the typewriter and we would like, you know, blow things up and shrink them down and make them, you know, so that was our self-publishing. My dad, you know, one summer I made a, we made a fanzine at his office and he had to like actually pay for it. And I didn't tell him. And he like got this bill for like theater. It's like, what the fuck happened here? Is that? That. But it's part of our, it's part of our lore. Um, and yeah, it's interesting that actually on Tuesday, not to plug another uh, event, but on Tuesday, the Smithsonian Institute, um, is library is doing a webinar. Um, I'll be, uh, it'll be on my Twitter, which is in with the name here Mo- at Molly D. Newman, um, uh, on zines. They have some of them in their, um, uh, in their library. And so my, the, the singer of Bratmobile, who's also, we, we did our fanzine together, Allison Wolf and I and some other people are going to be talking about fanzines in that sort of, I guess, more historical context, um, which is, it's pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, I, I like you, I mean, we, you grew up in Baltimore, but I grew up in DC. And um, so, you know, the Smithsonian is a very, like, that's a very wild <laughs> institution, you know, like in your consciousness, when you grew up in that area, you're like this, you know, it is the coolest thing, you know, as a kid to go to all these museums and, and everything. So it's, it's pretty funny to, to have that chance to, to speak really cool. on that. That's so cool. Uh, I also yeah. ran a fanzine when I was younger that was self-published at Office Depot. That's our age difference. I think Office Depot bought Kinko's or something. And, like we had to go to Kinko's. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah sorry, but I think this leads, there's a lot about like music and the way the music industry, no matter how technical we get with things, there's a lot of things that are still very grassroots. A lot of things that are still like, you got to go make the copies. You got to go stand the line and sell the CDs. You got to go do the I mean, things, right? I- I, I feel there. I, I I wish that there were days that, I, it, you know, maybe this is my own baggage. I have to shake at some point, but I do sometimes feel like a better paid intern 
you know, like there are things that you just got to do yourself. And, you know, you're like, what am I doing with this spreadsheet? Like, this is not it, right? But it, it, it's fine. So, um, no, thank you so much, Christine, for the time and for your audience. And, um, you know, I think that the conference is, is so wonderful. And, um, yeah, thanks for everybody who was able to join. Thank you so much, Marlon. It was an absolute delight to get to interview you. Yay. Yay. Yeah, well, time. I'll see you in person again I, soon, I hope. Yes, yeah, so well, I'll see you there. Okay. Um, okay. And um, I hope your daughter has a wonderful birthday party. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> bye. bye.